Good morning. Uh, what a beautiful weekend we've had. Yeah, it's just been, isn't it gorgeous? I mean, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, today, we are concluding our series on the Holy Spirit. And do you know what today is on the church calendar? Pentecost Sunday. How about that? How about that? It gets better. I was listening to an interview uh, of a pastor who had written a book called Pentecost and the Rapture. And he claims he can prove that the rapture is going to come on some Pentecostal Sunday. So I told Susan, I said, now what time is it in Israel? There's seven hours ahead. So at two in the morning, if it's at nine o'clock in the morning when it happened, you know, in Jerusalem, then that would be like two o'clock. And, you know, what's going to, you know. You know, it's, it's good to think it could be today. It could be today. You know, we, we lose sight of that, don't we? And so, you know, I was talking with Steve about just the condition of the world. It is, I mean, the evil in this world is rampant. And children are being attacked in such incredible ways on all fronts. It's evil. It's like it was in the days of Noah before the flood. And that's what Jesus said. I'm, I'm not, this is not the sermon. This is bonus. You get this for free. Okay? This is all for free. But, you know, wow. It, it, it is unbelievable where our world is going. Where did we get off track? I mean, we've never been fully on track. I understand that. But, wow. What evil. We've got to pray against this. And, and you know what? We're not guaranteed that we're not going to experience a little of this before he comes. And uh, I have a good friend who is a, a pastor who is a post-tribulationalist. And this plays right into his, his theology. And, and I, you know, I said, well, it could be. It could be that we are really going to be going through a time where it's going to be really rough. And we're going to have to band together in little groups. Uh, this summer and fall, we're, I think we're going to see some things in our nation that are incredible. And if our hearts are not strong in Jesus, we're, we're going we're to lose heart, aren't we? And we can't do that. We're not going to let Satan steal our joy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came to give us abundant life, John 10.10. 10. And we have to claim that, and we have to walk in that. But we've got to believe it. And we just have to be so careful about what we take in from the world. So today we're concluding this series. This is the big wrap-up, the grand application of the whole series. And I hope it's been beneficial for you. I think it's, it's been so important. I know you're not used to topical sermon series, but I think this one has been a very, very important one. And what I'm going to say today is going to be just the, the apex of what you need to know because it makes it so eminently practical. And if you did not pick up a handout today, please get one and don't toss it in the trash can when you get it home. Keep it because you're going to need to go back to this and refer to it for the rest of your Christian life. Okay, it's that important. All right, and I'm not going to charge you for it. It sounds, like a, it sounds like an infomercial, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we'll throw in a second one for free, <laughs> and there's no shipping. Okay. So anyway, it is good to be here, and it is good to commemorate the fact that the Holy Spirit came as Jesus promised, fell on all believers, and every one of us who knows Jesus as our Savior possesses the Holy Spirit. And we have this dynamic dynamo, dynamite, it comes from the word dunamis, power within us that comes from the Holy Spirit. And what flips that on or activates that is our yieldedness. And so we're going to be talking about that yieldedness. When you hear me talking about filling, just remember, filling means yielding. And filling means control. Think of the sailboat. When the sail is filled with air, you know it's being empowered through the water. So that's, that's very important today. All right, let me begin with this question. 
What percentage of American Christians would you estimate are experiencing spirit-filled lives as disciples of Jesus Christ? One percent. Okay. You can give me some feedback. Just throw a number at me. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Ten. Ten. Wow. Okay. Twenty. Twenty-five. No, five. Uh-oh, five. Okay. Do I hear thirty? Do I hear thirty? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I came to this uh, question this week in preparing this message. I thought, I wonder if we can find any kind of polling that would give us an indication as to the condition of the Christian church, how we're doing. Now, um, I, I sent to, to Gary and to the leadership team a study done that determined that only 37% of pastors hold a biblical worldview. Now that's an indicator. If only 37% of pastors hold a biblical worldview, where are we going? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's bad. Now, that's all pastors, so that includes a lot of mainline denominations where they've already thrown inerrancy out anyway. That's the first thing to go, because then everybody can decide what is right in their own eyes. So I, I estimated that it was going to be at least less than half. From my experience with pastors and talking with them about the people in their churches, what I read in the news, because I'm always looking for indicators to tell us where are we now, what's our condition, and what do we need to do about it? If that percentage is low, and you were all throwing at me low numbers, then what does that tell us about the condition of the number that's left over? And the lack of the impact in our culture. It's very weak. It's very anemic. It's impotent. We are not having the influence that Jesus expects us to have. And why is that? I'm glad you asked, because today I want to answer that for you. I can't, these, this is a study I came across. Uh, this is from the Barna Group. Can you actually read that text? Okay, I didn't think so. I couldn't blow it up any larger than that. Even if I just did one per slide, it still wasn't going to be any bigger. Let me just tell you, I'm going to actually have to turn around myself to read it. I want to start with this one on the left which dealt with the spectrum of discipleship, the discipleship community. All right. It says, of those that they polled, this is the Barn Organization, Arizona Christian University, 39% of Christians are not engaged in discipleship. That's almost 4 of 10 are not involved in discipleship. They're, they're either not going to church, or they're coming to church on Sunday, and that's pretty much it in their life. They're not in small groups. They're not in a, a spiritually mentoring relationship with another Christian. 39%. That is very discouraging. Now, it breaks it down on this pie chart. 28% are... Oh, get out of here. A laser pointer. Is that true? <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, that. That's so cool. I feel like a corporate IBM person up here talking. Okay. So here, here, right here, which you can't even read. All right. 28% are not involved in a discipleship community. Uh, the little light green area that is right here, discipling others, 5% of Christians are actively discipling others. Okay? 28% are only being discipled. Okay, so we saw that they're in a discipleship community. All right, these are low. But go over to this chart on the right. And this is very discouraging. U.S. Christians on walking with Jesus. Now, it's the same. The numbers are important. All Christians is this color right here. Then this is those in discipleship groups. 
this are only discipling others. And this green is only being discipled. And this percentage is though, are those who are not involved at all. All right, so let me read to you. So you can see the colors from where you are, unless you're colorblind, and I can't help you with this. That won't happen. All right. The top line, the, it looks like purple from here. The question is, my relationship with Jesus brings me deep joy and satisfaction. Only 45% of Christians would agree with that statement. Now, for those that are involved in discipling communities, men's and women's groups, small groups, one-on-one -on -one groups, 65% say it brings them satisfaction. Isn't that good? When you're actively engaged in discipleship, it raises your satisfaction level with Christ. Because see, you're in community. You're experiencing the entire body of Christ in a very active way. 58% uh, those who are only discipling others say it brings them satisfaction. 46% who are only being discipled. And 30% that are not engaged in discipleship would say that that statement is true of them. It's the second one that I think is really interesting. My relationship with Jesus impacts the way I live my life every day. See, that's the real issue. Is it something that I adhere, that I believe in, but I'm not living it out? I mean, I got it up here, but I'm not walking it out, okay? Look at that. 41% of Christians say it does not impact the way they live their lives. Now, that shouldn't be surprising, should it? That's less than half. That's four out of ten Christians say it does not impact their life. Wow. Wow. Now, now those who are in discipleship community, it's almost 60%. Six in ten. That's good. All right? But look down here at the very bottom in the red. 26% who are not engaged in discipleship at all would say that they only, that, that percentage agrees with them. So there is a huge disconnect, isn't there? Do we see this? It's everywhere. It's, it's across America because this is an American poll. So this is, what, this is what we're seeing being lived out. When you and I read the news and we read about pastors who are falling or going woke or we, we read about Christians who claim to be Christians and they're living totally contrary to to the will of God, this is why we're seeing that. One of the big takeaways is get yourself in a discipling relationship. You've got to do that. That is normal Christian living. Not showing up on Sunday and going home and then coming back the next Sunday. There needs to be that contact. And to the extent that you are involved, the smaller the group the more effective I believe it is. When I talk to pastors, I talk about macro discipleship is what you do every Sunday morning. You are discipling, but you're doing it on such a grand scale, it's not going to have nearly the effectiveness that micro discipleship does, one-on-one. -on -one. So, I'm always impressed when I hear a younger adult say, I need a mentor in my life. Now, those in the business world seek that out. But I can count on less than five fingers the number of young people who've said to me, would you mentor me? Or could you help me find a discipler or a spiritual mentor? It's very rare. And yet, when you've got somebody that you're accountable to, it pushes that up. So put yourself in some kind of a relationship where you can do that. Now, what I want to share with you today comes primarily from Dr. Bill Bright from Campus Crusade for Christ. He has a little booklet, and I was introduced to it when I was in college, but I just didn't appreciate it until after I got out of college. And it's called, Have You Made the Wonderful Discovery of the Spirit-Filled Life? And so 
The vast majority of what I'm going to share with you today comes from that. I can't improve on it. It's just too good. I've tweaked on it, but this, this, most of this comes from what Dr. Bright said. All right. He identifies three kinds of people, and he's citing the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to ask you to read this with me aloud, if you will, please. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For a while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? The New American Standard translates that last phrase. Are you not walking like mere men? And what he's saying is, are you not acting like the natural man? You're a Christian, but you're acting like a non-Christian. Now, we know that this goes on, don't we? we? We see this. Hopefully it's not us. But it does happen. So he identifies these three people. The natural person, the spiritual person, and the person of the flesh. And he's writing this to the Corinthians because he's, he's having to dress them down because they're still acting like spiritual babies. And he says, you should, you should be beyond this by now. The way you're behaving. He's not talking about their theology. He's talking about their behavior. You're behaving like little children. Grow up. So I'm sure, I mean, these are harsh words. As we know, he has much to say to the Corinthians because that is one messed up church. But that goes on today. So I want to look at these three kinds of people. The first person is the natural person. This person is self-directed. It is someone who has not received Christ as Savior. And as he said, the natural man does not accept the things of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Now you're going to see some illustrations here. The circle represents a person's life. And that chair is the throne or the control center of a person's life. And you'll notice that self is sitting on the throne of that person's life. That person is controlling their own life. And notice where Christ is. He's outside the life. But you see all those dots that are out of a pattern? They're, they're frustrated. They're mixed up. It's because their life is not operating within the will of God. Now this doesn't mean that as a spiritual Christian, you don't go through some frustration and suffering. Jesus promised us, in this world you will have tribulation. If you came to Christ thinking, hey, I'm going to get a problem-free life, you talk to the wrong salesman. Because that's not true. If anything, you get more problems. Because now you're going against the world system rather than with the world system. But this describes that person. We know people just like this. And hopefully, you're praying for people that you know that are just like this. And hopefully, you're praying, Holy Spirit, convict them of their sin. Draw them to Christ as their Savior. And you may be praying that for 10, 20, 30, 80 years. I don't know. But if those people matter to you, that's the most loving thing you can do. And look for opportunities to tell them about Jesus. And when they blow you off, you continue to maintain your testimony. You love them. 
You serve them. You're available to them when they're going through rough times. But you're praying constantly for this person. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah? Come on, I need to see more heads bobbing like this. Bobble heads. I need to see bobble heads. Okay. So let's look at some of these traits of the natural person. Self-directed person. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now this is what Paul said just before he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and then he gives you those nine fruits that uh, the Holy Spirit produces within us. Paul in Romans chapter 1 says this. He's just given a whole dissertation on people who will not acknowledge God. And how God has turned them over. And he's just spent a section talking about the, the dishonorable passions that he turned them over to. He's talking about homosexuality. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Sounds like the Apostle Paul's been checking out the same news sites that I've been reading. <laughs> when you look at those two lists, is this not what we're seeing in the world today? Especially in America? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Now let's look at the spiritual person. This person is spirit-directed, not self-directed. Notice the difference in the diagrams. Christ is not only in this person's life, Christ is seated on the throne of this person's life, controlling this person's life. And self has just been dethroned. Not my will, but your will be done. That's that person. And look at all those things in their life. They can be in balance with God's will and God's word because the Spirit is directing them. The Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. And he directs that person. Paul said, He who is spiritual appraises all things, for we have the mind of Christ. Now, let's look at some of these attributes. And this is just, this is not necessarily as easy to find scripturally in one spot. It's got a drawing from different places. Christ centered, they're empowered by the Holy Spirit, they introduce others to Christ. They have an effective prayer life. They understand God's word. They trust and obey God. They experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Right. Quite a contrast from the natural person to the spiritual person, isn't it? Then we have the fleshly person, the person that's right in the middle who wants to ride the rail and not land on either side, not make a commitment either way. Someone who has professed Christ, oh, I received Jesus. I remember walking up an aisle in a church service during VBS week or whatever it was, and I, I remember that when I was in college. I remember I did that. But they live in defeat because they're trying to live the Christian life in their own strength. And this is who Paul was talking about when he said, I can't speak to you as spiritual people. You're, you're babies. You're babies in your behavior. You know, you should be moving on and you're not. So look at this person's life. It's really not that much different than the first person we looked at. What's the difference? Christ is in their life. But that's the only difference. Because they said, I, I've done that. I, I, I made that decision. I trusted Christ for my salvation. Some of the following traits may characterize this person. Unbelief, disobedience, a poor prayer life, 
No desire for Bible study. Legalistic attitudes or a critical spirit. Impure thoughts. Jealousy. Guilt. Frustration. Aimlessness. Worry and discouragement. A loss of love for God and for others. You know, these are the same kind of traits you see in the natural person. Now, I want to be clear on this. It is possible when you read 1 John, you can see that, that a person may not really be in the faith. They may think they have made that decision and they've made that transaction, but it's not happened. They could, they could say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm just, I'm not, you know, a Jesus freak. I'm not one of those kind of people. They may not even be a believer. But here's the thing. God alone is the sole judge of who is and who isn't. We don't know. We honestly don't know. We can suspect and we can warn and we can say, you know, I think you better be sure about this. But only God knows what that person is. Because all of this sin, it's just what are the sins that a Christian can absolutely not commit? I don't have an answer to that. I don't think Scripture addresses it. We don't know where that line is. If we knew where that line was, we'd go all the way up and say, I'm going to enjoy it up to here, but I'm not going to cross over. And so God doesn't identify that for us. In His wisdom, I think He does that purposely. He will not let us know. So it's like, if you're, if you're not sure, you need to make sure you've done it. Okay. Jesus promised the abundant and fruitful life as the result of being filled or empowered by His Spirit. One becomes a Christian through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, according to John 3, 1-8. From the moment of spiritual birth, the Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit at all times. He doesn't leave and come back. Leave and come back. He stays in that person. But although all Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, not all Christians are filled <coughs> or directed or empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of the ever overflowing life. He came to glorify Christ. And when one is controlled by the Holy Spirit, he or she lives as a true disciple. They live as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Even in his last command before his ascension, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit and that he would help them to be witnesses for him. So this is very important. Now, we've talked about this, going back to point number one. In classic charismatic theology, they would say you must have a, a second experience. Some would call it being slain in the spirit. And that's as far as some of their theology goes. If you've had that one experience, then you're filled with the Holy Spirit. To which I'd say, yeah, I think you are. But it doesn't last. There's something that you need to do. And there's a problem that we need to address. So I want you to look at these three illustrations. And ask yourself, which one best describes you in general? And which one describes you at this specific point in time? Today. Right now. Well, most of you, if not all of you, would probably say, well, I'm not the natural person. I don't know that I'm always living like the spiritual person, but I'm not real, real bad like the fleshly Christian. So I'm confused. I don't know where I am. Okay. Well, there's a way that we can deal with this. But we need to ask ourselves this question. Are we, as Christians, walking like mere men? Are we walking like the natural man? Look at these descriptions. Again, these are the descriptions of the natural man. They could very likely, these are the kind of sins that a fleshly Christian could be involved in. There are Christians that are involved in all these things. Are they Christians or are they not Christians? I don't know. 
God knows. I don't know. But there are times, I mean, just some of these seem really worse than others, don't they? But let's say boastful. We don't think of that as being as bad as, say, sexual immorality. Envy. Well, that's not nearly as bad as homosexuality. Being haughty, being foolish. But yet, these are the things that describe the natural person. And I think if we're honest, we have to say there are times when I sin that I'm guilty of some of those things. Well, then does that mean I'm the fleshly Christian? Well, I don't know. What day is it? What time is it right now? <laughs> you know, because. All Christians fall into fleshly living on an ongoing basis. Some short-term and others long-term. We focus on the people that are long-term. But when we retake control of our lives and choose to sin, we're actually indulging flesh. We're acting like fleshly people. Do you see? We're putting ourselves back up on the throne. So there are times when we kind of flip back and forth between the spiritual person and the fleshly Christian. So what should we do when we're convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit in order to re-yield control to Him? Is this a one-and-done activity or a continuous one? It's a continuous one. Why? Because we continually sin. Now, I've talked to Christians that have told me, I don't sin anymore. <laughs> really? What book did you read? i got to get me that book. Well, they got a book. But what they fail to understand is that there's positional holiness and then there's practical holiness. Yes, positionally, you and I are regarded as righteous in a legal way. But that doesn't mean that we don't sin. Oh, that 1 John 1, 9, that doesn't relate to Christians. That's talking about non-Christians. No, it's talking to Christians. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, that just means before the person comes to Christ. No. If we say we have no sin, we call God a liar, and the truth is not in us. We all sin on a regular basis. Hopefully it's only very, very short term. And hopefully we sin less, not that we become sinless, but we should sin less. As we remember our love for Jesus, for what He's done for us, the sacrifice that he's made for us. And our desire to see God and Jesus glorified through our lives as we yield to the Holy Spirit, hopefully we will say, I don't want to sin. Spirit, help me not to yield to that sin. And that's what he'll do. He'll help us with that. So I want to introduce you to the concept of spiritual breathing. It's confession of sin and appropriating God's forgiveness. As we retake control of our life through sin, which is a conscious or an unconscious act of disobedience, breathe spiritually. Spiritual breathing, exhaling and inhaling. So you're exhaling the impure, you're inhaling the pure, is an exercise that enables us to continue to experience God's restoration and the Spirit's filling. So when you exhale, you're confessing your sin. You're agreeing with God concerning your sin and thank Him for His forgiveness for it, according to 1 John 1, 9. Confession involves repentance. Repentance means a change in thinking and attitude which results in godly actions. So there has to be a change up here. I'm guilty. I've sinned against you. An admission. That's what it is. And then you inhale. 
surrender the control of your life to Christ and appropriate or receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit by faith. Trust that he now directs and empowers you according to the commands in Galatians 5.16. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And then in 25 it talks about keeping in step with the Spirit. Sin breaks it. And also the promise of 1 John 5, 14, 15, which says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, then we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Is it God's will that we confess our sin? Absolutely. So if we confess our sin, we can be assured it's his will and he's going to cleanse us. He's going to forgive us. He's going to restore us. So our fellowship with God has been broken when we sin. And it, what it does is it actually thwarts the efforts of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because we're taking control of our life again. Give me the wheel. I want the wheel. Okay? That's crazy. The Lord needs to be in the driver's seat always. But when we choose to sin, we're saying, I want the wheel. Can't do that. Can't have two drivers. So here's the application. How do we yield to the power of the Holy Spirit? First of all, you've got to sincerely desire it. You have to hunger and thirst for it. Do that to be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, Confess your sins on an ongoing basis as the Spirit convicts you. All right? You just cut off that guy in traffic because you're in a hurry and he blows his horn and gives you some kind of a hand sign. <laughs> <laughs> you sin. Father, forgive me. Forgive me. I shouldn't have done that. Thank you that you, you have given me the promise that if I confess my sin, you will forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me. Forgive me. Restore me. By faith, thank God that He has forgiven you of your sins. All of our sins are painful. But we still break fellowship with God when we choose to sin. Present every area of your life to God. You know, it's, it's like that thing I shared with you about um, my heart, Christ's home. You remember? Where the guy's doing an illustration of his heart like a home. And he doesn't want Jesus to see the closet and he doesn't want him to see other things. What he's saying is, I'm happy for you to look at this, but I don't want you to see that. There are those secret areas of our life that we say, but I'm doing all this. Can I just entertain this? No. No, you can't. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or logical or reasonable form of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we go out here, Satan through the world system has a very definite agenda to draw us away from God. We come here, we say, we want to live for God. We want to be walking in the Spirit. We want to glorify God. But we got to We spend more time out there than we do here. And we're constantly being bombarded by demonic, secular, satanic messages, sometimes cleverly wrapped up so we don't recognize it. And we buy it, just like a big old fish. Right, Jeff? Grab that lure along, take a big old bite out of it, and he snags us. And we can't do that. So, by prayer, in faith, claim the fullness of the Holy Spirit according to God's commands to live under his control. So if you and I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, we must keep very short accounts of sin. When he convicts us, we need to stop. We don't have to wait till the end of the day. We can just do it right there. We can breathe spiritually. 
Exhale, confess that sin, inhale the pure, and receive God's forgiveness and cleansing. It's as simple as that, but it has to become a routine. So, hopefully, you're to that point, and I'm to that point. You know, this whole series, I've been trying to say, you must yield to the Holy Spirit. And if you have not heard that enough, I've not done a good job of teaching that. Or, you don't really want to hear it. But this is spiritual truth. This is spiritual reality. We don't have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. He's our helper. He's going to empower us. We should embrace that. Because he helps us to glorify Jesus and he helps us to glorify God. So, are you playing Tetris on that phone again? It's, it's my medical. Okay, all right. I thought it was Jeff. He's got his phone out there. Right now. No. Jeff, are you playing Tetris? <laughs> okay. I've given you two suggested prayers. And these are just suggested. Use them as, as an example. But this is something that I found helpful. Here's one for the morning. And notice that I'm addressing all three members of the Trinity. <clears throat> Father, thank you for watching over me during the night and allowing me to dwell in safety. As this new day begins, I'm again consciously reporting in to serve you. I desire to yield my life to you in such a way as to bring you great glory. Jesus, Again, I express my eternal gratitude for the sacrifice you made on my behalf that I am forgiven for all my sin. In response, I, to, I desire to demonstrate my love for and yielding to you by obeying all that you have commanded. Holy Spirit, I recognize the enormous ministry you have in my life. I willingly yield to your empowering control that I might keep in step with you rather than relying on my own fleshly efforts. This is one of the ways you can start to do this. This was the clue I told you about that I heard from, from Jim. Praying that every day. Praying that, that you giving control to the Holy Spirit is so important because he's the one that's going to help us to avoid the flesh. We're still going to be tempted but listen, I need all the help I can get if I want to live a godly life. I don't want to just have to get it out of my own strength, my own flesh. It's weak, but the spirit is strong. And then I also gave you an evening prayer because I gave you a morning prayer. I figured I should give you an evening, evening prayer. <clears throat> Father, I renounce my sins against you that I've not already confessed. And then name them as the spirit brings them to, to your mind. Thank you for forgiveness and cleansing. I also ask you to provide me a night of restful sleep and protection in the presence of my spiritual enemies. Surround this home with your holy angels to guard me and my family from the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Jesus, may I maintain your mind as I sleep, meditating only on the things that are godly. I claim your blood over me and mine for our protection. Holy Spirit, as I wind down and sleep, Bring to my mind godly thoughts and, and any dreams you desire to communicate to me. So there's a morning yielding and there's an evening yielding. Now, written prayers are just written prayers. They can become rote and meaningless if you allow them to be. Tweak on this. Make it your own. But pray that you're yielding to the Lord at the beginning of your day, make sure you confessed your sins. So very, very important. So, this is the talk that walk question. I want to hear your thoughts on it. What reasons can you identify as to why Christians do not live under the control of the Holy Spirit's empowering? What do you think? Yeah, Kevin. Uh, I'll go back to the first slide you had. 63% uh, of 
pastors are not teaching the truth of the Bible? 37%. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, you're right, you're right. 63 or 9. Good, good. And 5% of Christians are being discipled. Okay. Good. Okay. Someone else? Yeah. <laughs> oh. That's all you hear is That's whatever right. makes you feel good. Whatever makes you feel good. That's right. You bet. Hey, and sin is pleasurable. Yes. It is. Right? Or we wouldn't do it, right? All right, I guess I'll sin today. <laughs> it's going to hurt, but I guess I'm going to do it. <laughs> coming on a horse to slay and to, to enforce the, the wrath of God. Yeah, we think of Jesus as a buddy. He's my buddy. And I mean, you know, he, he knows me. He likes me anyway. So you're right. We don't have a right concept of God or, or Jesus. And Janice has talked about this before, about how when, when she's and you know thinking about a sin, she remembers, she forces herself to remember the costly sacrifice of Jesus. And, and it, it stops her. And, you know, we watch those movies around Easter time, and we all get a lump in our throat and a tear in our eye. But and hopefully we think about it at communion time. But do we think about it on a daily basis? Probably not. I don't. This prayer helps me to think of it on a daily basis. Okay? Some other thoughts. Yeah, Jeff? I think part of it is, uh, and you alluded to this a lot in your series, is a lot of Christians just simply don't understand what that means yeah. to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. And as you pointed out, they hear the word, the term Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, and just all kinds of, you know, some mysterious thing, or they relate mm -hmm. to the Holy Spirit as taught in other denominations, whatever. And for whatever reason, lack of discipleship or hearing bad teaching, whatever, they just don't take the time to find out what that means. But just a cursory reading of Paul's epistles, you can't miss it, you know. It's, it's all over there. Isn't it? yeah, it's, it's pretty much everything he taught, you know. Uh, flesh versus the spirit, yield to the spirit or else you will walk in, you know, it's, yeah. it's everywhere. You can't, but I, I think that's one of the reasons is just people just don't, aren't familiar with what, what it means. Yeah. Could be just ignorance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. I th I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying there are a lot of things we're that we're ignorant about. Right? Generation that been mm -hmm. Oh, and it's getting worse. Yeah, you know, it's the younger. bad. I mean, yeah. really bad. Yeah. You know, this, what I do when I work on these messages is I do all my work to give it to you first. And then what I do is I rewrite it into a small group curriculum. And I, the two groups, well, the three groups, 
that I lead, two of them are at the, the Lilburn Church and one is my own group. The guys in the Lilburn Church go, uh, I've never heard this stuff before. And these are guys that have been in that church for 30 years. This is all new. Wow. How could I miss this? And these are not slouches, spiritually speaking. They're, they're sharp guys. But it's like, wow, I've really been missing out. So ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. Jessica? Um, I would say, I think, especially now, um, kind of what they were saying too, that Satan has really shifted people's perspective of what is evil is good and what is good is oh, evil. Yeah. So the idea of oh, I don't want to... They all have a clear understanding of the fear of God. So now we actually put the fear of man above God and say, well, yeah, I, I don't want to be rejected and I don't want to be judging somebody or I don't want to come off as this mean person who has these ideas of what is right. And yeah, maybe what they believe is right and what I believe is different. And this whole web of lies, I think, gets put in us, especially I feel like the um, the youth to think, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I don't want to be a mean person. I want to yeah. just accept everything. Sure. So you fear that rejection because I feel like growing up too, you're trying to find your tribe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if your home is broken and you don't have spiritual parents and spiritual uh, uh, mentors, then you're going to find a tribe that's going to accept you. And unfortunately, there's not that many, you know, strong believers, I guess. Since, yes. Mm -hmm. since One. Yeah. So in Acts 2, it talks about that the church met daily from house to house. They had a whole lot of fellowship, which would have given them opportunity to confess sins to one another, to pray for each other to get the support that they needed and today people come to their wherever their church family is they worship and a lot of them today are actually just doing it over zoom and they're not getting that fellowship away from sunday and that really takes away from encouraging us to Stay with the Spirit. Stay underneath Him because we see other people doing it and it encourages us. Yeah. I mean, that, that's so important. It is very, very important. Yeah. And that has always the notion, if you know what's right, I can always do that tomorrow. Today, I'm just saying one more time. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Gary. Uh, it may not stay on the spiritual, but uh, it, it takes work and discipline. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, Jane and I work to, uh, for our marriage to show love. And it's, that's the, to me, that's the greatest uh, way I, that she shows love. She's working to love me more. She has to work to she love does. me. She does. <laughs> she really, like you. I can't imagine. She really does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Well, uh, Paul told Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. You know, uh, for bodily discipline is of little value, but godliness is profitable for all things. There are some people who are much more concerned about their bodily discipline. You know, I pass them when I'm driving here to church. They're out there <laughs> running up and down, you know. And physically, they look a whole lot better than I do. <laughs> but then I wouldn't wear spandex. So, <laughs> but... We wouldn't want you to. I uh, know. You wouldn't want me to. That would not be a pretty sign. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, we have to discipline ourselves to do that. And discipline's not fun, but we have to do it. Uh, so somebody else is hand over. Yeah. Yeah, one thing I never helped me uh, understand it completely when I was in some uh, Bible college when I was younger. I really had to drill down in the Galatians 5.16 where it says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And they're contrary one to the yeah. other, so you can't do the things that you need to do 
that's right. And that the whole thing says, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Right. So I was told, and you alluded to it, it could be a moment by moment <coughs> thing. The more we yield, obviously, we're going to be in a direct communion and relationship with our Lord. But the more we let the have less control, then we're going to have that experience, that struggle and defeat. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's pray. And um, next week we begin a new series on the book of Titus. Okay, Titus this summer. And um, so there you go. All right, Father, we, we thank you for what you share with us in your word. Holy Spirit, we thank you for teaching us what is in the Word of God to help us understand what life in the Spirit is all about. Again, we celebrate, Holy Spirit, your coming uh, to indwell all Christians on this Pentecost Sunday. And we ask that, that we live lives where we not only just possess your presence in our life, but that, that we're yielded and empowered on a constant basis. This is a new discipline for us, but we really need it. So we know it's within the will of God to ask this. So I guess we could thank you ahead of time in faith that you're going to do it. So I thank you for the transformation that's going to occur in lives as a result of us putting your word into practice. And we do desire to bring glory to the Godhead. And we, we thank you for the availability of all three, uh, to help us to be the people that you call us to be. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, Jefferson. Amen.